Good morning, everybody. And for those of you in Europe, good evening. Um, a warm welcome to you joining us live today. And a very warm welcome to the uh, many hundreds of you that will be joining us in the future on our YouTube channel. Um, just one notice for this evening, and that is um, next, next Friday, we have our um, Christmas lecture. And it's uh, Professor Anna Scaife talking about Doggle Bank, the Cold War, and the Space Race. So for those of you interested in that period of our history, it'll be a very interesting evening, I'm sure. Um, however, tonight, it gives me great pleasure to announce not one, but two of our friends from um, across the Atlantic Ocean, from SARA. Um, those of you that have not yet discovered the SARA Journal, I do commend it to you. Check out the website and um, sign up. It's a phenomenal resource. And um, I'm so pleased to introduce um, Dr. Richard. Um, oh, your name's going out of my head. Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely yeah. getting old. Russell. <laughs> yes, Richard Russell. Yes, it was um, confusing me because your name tag says treasurer, and I knew you were Mr. Treasurer. I, um, I can't change it for some reason. It's stuck there. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> these things happen. Yes, so Dr. Richard Russell is, um, mm -hmm. is, is, is joining mm -hmm. us this evening. Pulsars as a mechanism for galactic uh, navigation. So, Richard, with no more words from me, over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Paul. And um, it's always great to have the uh, uh, your group involved and Sarah and uh, um, we're very happy to work with you guys. The um, I, uh, I started uh, uh, with the Deep Space Exploration Society. And um, that is a, uh, a group out of Colorado Springs, Colorado, that uh, uh, acquired or was given a 60 foot or an 18 meter dish. You can see in the background my uh, my picture. Uh, they worked for about 10 years getting it together. And um, only in the last two years were we able to get some science out of it. And um, since uh, we started up, we were able to been able to pull 15 pulsars from it. And um, the main uh, uh, goal that I had was one documented. It, you know, my uh, what I tell the group is, if you don't document it, it never really happened. It's just like a you know trying to catch it, claiming you caught a big fish and you don't have any documentation of it. It doesn't count. And um, pulsars are like catching fish. You, just, uh, you spend long hours or days trying to catch one, and you may get one out of a, a group. At least that's ours. Um, Wolfgang probably has a different. Uh, you know, he aims it and gets them. So uh, he has better uh, fly rod than I do for pulsars. But um, uh, one of the main other keys is, is that once you do get uh, pulsars or hydrogen or uh, whatever the uh, astronomical uh, uh, output you were, or measurement you were trying to get, what do you do with the data? I mean, how is it useful? So I started, um, uh, a galactic navigation series. And so I started that with hydrogen and I went to pulsars. And the reason I'm doing navigation is that my background is I'm a retired Navy submarine officer um, that uh, got shifted in the, uh, before I retired to uh, building spacecraft for the Navy. Uh, then I uh, um, basically did uh, in my civilian life, uh, did ground stations. Uh, and I was my last uh, job was the uh, chief architect for the Air Force Satellite Control Network, which is all the DOD uh, uh, ground stations. So um, I became very uh, familiar with big dishes and, um, and how they're tied together and uh, how they uh, communicate with uh, uh, satellites. Uh, when I retired, um, I discovered that uh, I didn't know anything about astronomy and uh, uh, and how am I going to use this big dish in receive only mode to do anything? And uh, since then, I've been teaching uh, astronomy. I've been doing all sorts of things. So it's really opened up a whole 
segment of my uh, um, experience here. So uh, the goal here was that, um, how do I use pulsars um, to navigate in space and just general space navigation? Uh, feel free to uh, comment anytime you want and uh, or ask questions. Uh, I'm, I am looking at chat, uh, so we'll do that. So um, how do you use pulsars to do galactic uh, location in space? Pulsars are very much like a uh, GPS in, a, in certain ways. Uh, you need more than one to determine your location in space. Uh, you need uh, at least three to do uh, three-dimensional geolocation in space. Um, I do have a, I did write this, uh, this is based on a paper I wrote, finding that that website, uh, Deep Space Exploration Society website, and um, with many other papers that the entire group has done over the years. So I'm gonna go over some basics here. Um, uh, basically, what's a pulsar? Uh, how do you do galactic path planning? Pulsar visibility along the path. It might be interesting to note that as you go from one area of the galaxy to the other, you will not see all the pulsars you currently see, and you'll pick up more pulsars that you've never seen before. Uh, that's because they have such a narrow window uh, in their pulse or in their uh, as they uh, turn that we're only seeing a, a small fraction of the pulsars that are out there just because we're not, don't happen to be in their beam right now, all right? But as you travel through the galaxy, you will see uh, more of them as you travel through their beams of uh, unknown pulsars. So just realize that uh, we have not seen all the pulsars. Um, there's a thing called a pulsar base period. In other words, what is the, uh, the actual pulsar spinning at? Um, this has uh, a lot to do, you know, this is sort of the time travel story of this whole thing, is that um, we are really looking at um, pulsars in their past, not their current, and pulsars are spinning down over time. So we are looking at multiple uh, uh, time periods in multiple pulsars, and uh, I'll show you a tool to use that, uh, that to figure out where you are. Uh, the ATNF is the Australian. Uh, uh, oh, now I forget how what it is. I'll get into it. The ATNF and Sinbad databases have uh, the current set of pulsars with their parameters in it. Um, we also did a pulsar simulator here at the Space Exploration Society, which is very useful. Uh, it enables us to uh, simulate a pulsar and check out all our equipment. Um, I did uh, put together a uh, Excel three-dimensional uh, coordinate uh, computer uh, using the solver program in Excel. And that uh, allow me to determine the three-dimensional coordinates based on uh, pulsars and their, uh, their uh, the measured pulsar base period. Uh, then you have to select the pulsars. As I was saying, the, uh, in order to do pulsars, you have to have more than three and they have to be visible along the path. So one of the goals is how do I know that it's between two, two uh, I mean, like say the earth and uh, another planet that the pulsars I selected on earth are actually visible as I go to that planet. And you'll find that a lot of them aren't because of the, uh, um, they get out of the beam, your path gets out of the beam of the pulsar. So you can't use all the pulsars you're using on earth for, uh, um, for navigation, for the complete path. Uh, then, you know, how do you solve collective position? Okay, so that's the, that's the plan. I'm gonna get it done. Uh, Paul, you're gonna have to give me a, a five minute warning because I, I easily can talk for four hours on this and I don't wanna, you know, uh, Pablo is a better talker than I am. So I'm gonna let him, I want him to, I wanna hear his too. Okay, how do you do, let's pull our base. Picture is uh, a pulsar is called a compact object. Compact object is a uh, um, started as a star, and uh, for you know, be a supernova, be a uh, you know, some a star collapse, it's turned into what's called a compact object. Uh, it is basically held up; gravity crunches it. It's being held up by the neutrons. Um, 
it's a, it's, it's a neutron energy, you know, just the, the uh, ability of the neutrons to hold against gravity. So that's why it's a, it's a neutron star. Uh, if you get more gravity than the neutrons can handle, that's where it goes into a black hole. Okay. And at that point, nobody knows what can uh, actually stop the collapse after a black hole. But it's just on the edge of uh, having, uh, you know, a black hole fundamentally is it's the gravity is so strong that it actually bends light down toward it. And, you can, and that's why you can't see it. it as a vent horizon. Pulsars are on that edge. You can still see the pulsar. The electromagnetic energy still comes out of it. Um, and uh, so you still have the, uh, uh, you still can uh, see, see energy from a pulsar. Now, how does it work? Um, there's a, basically a, a pulsar is spinning very fast because when it collapses, it uh, retains angular momentum. And that angular momentum uh, from a uh, the diameter of a star down to a diameter of about 12 kilometers uh, of an object causes a very fast spin rate and um, an electromagnetic, a very strong electromagnetic field. That field turns into uh, the beam we're talking about. And the only reason um, that we can see that pulsar is that we happen to be in the beam, okay? If we were off the beam, uh, we would never see the pulsar. That's one of the results of doing galactic navigation through space is if we were, a spacecraft moves away from the Earth, it may not see the beam of a pulsar that happens to be aimed at Earth now. So that's a that's one of you galactic navigators. You're going to have to go pick up more pulsars along the way and document them. Um, this is a a, a pulsar uh, spin period. So the period is how fast is it spinning, and p dot is the first derivative, which is explaining how how it's slowing down. Uh, it's slowing down because it is producing a lot of electromagnetic uh, uh, magnetic fields. Those fields are slowly um, spinning down the pulsars uh, over time. So they go from the spin period actually goes from a, uh, a high rate uh, and down to a low rate. This is a period. So 10 seconds is a long spin as opposed to 0.01 seconds. And um, the uh, so this is normally, you know, crab pulsars somewhere over here. Uh, some of the magnetars, that if you talk to Wolfgang, he's got them found one over here. And so generally the life cycle of a pulsar goes from up in the upper left to the lower right. And they call this the uh, graveyard pulsars because at a certain point they spin down and they're not seen anymore. There's just not enough energy to, for us to see them. So a lot of the pulsars end up down there. Um, and uh, now, if they are a single pulse, a single pulsar without a binary on them, what will happen is that they will stay in this graveyard here. But if they're a binary star with a pulsar on them and they come down here, what happens is some of these pulsars start eating their neighbor and start spinning back up. And they tend to drop down here and they turn into uh, millisecond pulsars, very high speed pulsars that are in the milliseconds. So you got this pile here, or millisecond pulsars. These are also very uh, hard. I, I have not detected one yet, but I think uh, uh, there's uh, Wolfgang's got numerous of them. And, uh, but that's where they go. And that has happens because the, the physics was that they started to eat their neighbor and they, they got more, as they get more material, they spin up faster and uh, they basically come back alive from where they were. Okay, this is the uh, uh, HDNet database, Australian uh, Telescope National Facility. There, I got it. And I um, uh, highly recommend anybody interested in pulsars uh, go to this database. It's a fully searchable database, it gives you uh, all the information about the pulsar. And one of the key things I was looking for here is what is the galactic coordinates of the pulsar, uh, the period, the uh, um, P0 is the period and P1 is the P dot and it gives you the distance. So you have to have a relatively uh, 
good knowledge of distance on this, at least for the first estimates. Okay. Now realize also when you talk about galactic coordinates, there's two two types that you'll see. First is the galactic coordinates you normally see, for example, in this database are Earth-centered galactic coordinates. In other words, it's from the Earth um, to the uh, position. So all the angles, the thing are from the Earth, et cetera. Then there's a, uh, but in order to do galactic navigation, you really need to have galactic centric. So I want it from the, the center of the galaxy. So you have to make an adjustment to take galact Earth galactic uh, coordinates to go to galactic centric coordinates. And there's a, a, a small a very, uh, way to do that. It's a, a small calibration on that. So realize that and realize the, uh, the period is the period observed from Earth. Um, and it's not necessarily the base period. And I'm gonna say the base period is, if you're actually sitting on the pulsar, what is the period of the spin? And um, as opposed to, if you're on Earth, what is the period <laughs> you're measuring? Uh, P1 is the spin down rate. Uh, that is also problematic a little bit. We're going to use that as a, a constant here, even though it's not necessarily. Um, that is how fast it's how how it's slowing down, and slowing down can have a, be affected by many things. There's things called glitches, where the uh, the actual uh, spin uh, shifts really dramatically, uh, etc. So the spin down rate. Um, Going to have to be monitored very closely uh, in order to use this to gain accuracy on your uh, your navigation. Simbad also has a database you can actually pull up the data on these uh, uh, this stuff too. Okay, now this is a little uh, little pulsar geometry here. Uh, you see the center of the pulsar uh, is here. Here's the beam. Um, what's the interest is is this angle here of rho. That is the distance here um, that the uh, between the center of the uh, the beam to the edge of the beam. The reason that's important is that we the only way we can see the pulsar is if we're somewhere inside that beam. Okay, so uh, if we were within two row, the assumption is that I made assumption you can see the pulsar. That may be weaker on the edge of the beams from the center. Etc. But the the goal here was first cut, assume something. Now, one other thing is ninety degrees. If I had a beam of ninety degrees, there's a problem when the beam goes past ninety degrees. Is that the closer it gets to directly uh, away from being perpendicular to the say the north part of the of the uh, pulsar. And if it's try, if the beam comes down almost to 90 degrees, the edge of that beam is starting to get close to the speed of light, and there's a limitation on that. So it cannot be greater than 90 degrees because of that, and it's really going to be above 90 degrees normally. So, uh, um, but anyway, so if I'm anywhere near the 90 degree uh, part of that beam, I assume we could uh, be seen by the pulsar. I need to make that assumption because when we do the math, I need to find uh, the area or I need to know what, how big the beam was so that I can uh, determine if uh, we can see it from the spacecraft. Uh, that can also be the model will allow me to change that, lower the beam, that would just cause us to see fewer pulsars along the path. Okay, so um, I did a galactic path model. And this is relatively simple. Once you get the galactic center coordinates and you pick a, uh, I picked a position from earth to a, uh, a known uh, Earth, uh, potentially Earth type uh, exoplanet called Kepler 452b. And basically I uh, did three dimensional uh, galactic coordinates. And I said, okay, uh, you know, how am I gonna get from this, from Earth to here, galactic center coordinates. And you need three planes, you need X, Y, X, Z, and uh, uh, y is the coordinates uh, in order to do all three dimensions. Okay, so basically I split that up into into uh, three stops along the way. 
Why do I need to stop? Because I'm flying a faster than light spacecraft and I can't see a pulsar when I'm faster than light. Okay. So uh, everybody, all you Trekkie fans, they really need something besides, uh, you know, your common pulsar detector if they're traveling faster than light. So I'm assuming I'm stopping at each of those locations to take a fix. Okay. Much like I had to do when on a submarine where I had to come up periscope depth, put my antenna up and, and try to find a, a nav sat somewhere. All right. Very similar to uh, that. So that's, so I'm very in tune to what these guys would have to do if they're traveling faster than light. They can't, they can't get fixes as they're going. Okay. Okay. Um, the other thing to note is that there is a, so there's a beam angle, but realize that there is a, a, a big loop, big area where you cannot see the beam on the inside and the outside. Okay. So there's a rate, there's a, there's a, just basically a, uh, a donut of the beam here that you can see uh, if you're on earth. So your goal here is if you're going to use a certain pulsar, you need to be staying in that beam along the path, right? So you either change your path or you pick up other pulsars that um, that you can see in order to get, you know, as many pulsars as you can to do this. Okay. Sort of shows the three axis or the three dimensional from pulsar for you know the 14 uh, here here's 452b here's earth so you can sort of see how that all uh sort of looks from a geometry point of view a little math i threw this just in uh you know if anybody wants to take the slides and look how i got the math here um the uh so the Earth, the Earth pulsar destination angle here, um, you need to be able to find all these numbers, okay, in here in order to do the math right. Here's all the, the formulas to find those. Okay, um, I, I developed a tool using all that math in Excel using the Pulsar database as my starting point to determine if the angle of the Pulsar uh, was um, along the path was a, can be seen, okay? So if it's greater than two row, you can't see it. If it's less than two row, you can see it. And so you pick your path uh, and then the the tool will give me a green if I can see it and a red if I can't see it. All right, so now I can pick out my pulsars that are using the entire database. I can pull the pulsars that can be seen from Earth because that's the only ones I know about right now and uh, determine if they can be seen anywhere along that path. Um, and the goal is that in, along that path, say at the 25% mark, I could probably, I might be able to find six pulsars there, but I'd have to probably find a different set of six pulsars or another uh, along a different part of the path because it, it would be out of the beam somewhere else. So is that our current database sufficient for that? That'd be the question. I'm sure the farther away we get from earth, the, uh, the more problematic it'd be that I can't use the earth Pulsar database uh, without having more pulsars available. So that's why it's having missions going out, finding more pulsars farther from Earth is going to be important in our uh, our future. This is what it looks like. Um, I left some of the these open here, but uh, the ones that are within the beam here are uh, is that all three axes have to be visible. So for example, this one here is only visible in the XZ plane. That doesn't, it doesn't help. So they have to be only the ones that are visible in all three planes uh, count, the ones I can use. Uh, now, 
the model to figure out the angles. If you uh, basically close all this stuff up, you'll see that everything in green here on the different axes is, uh, um, you know, are the pulsars that are available. You notice that this is the pulsar database here with the J uh, name here, uh, galactic coordinates, everything. So basically this is all the model and uh, uh, everything in green is good. Okay, this is what the pulsars look like that were selected uh, on the galactic plane. I want to note real quickly here is that here's the Earth and here's Kepler 452b. They're extremely close together in galactic coordinates. Uh, I think it's a 16 light years apart. Uh, and I chose that because that's a, a reasonable time to be able to get radio astronomy from and uh, if somebody was going to transmit. But look at where all the other pulsars are. Now, remember that the distance the pulsar, the farther the pulsar is, the farther back in time we are seeing the uh, period. So the way the model is going to work is that if I have the base period of a pulsar that's at one second, that if I'm 10 light years away, I'm going to see 10, what that was spinning at 10 years ago. If I'm 20 year light years away, I'm going to see what I was spinning at 20 years ago and realize it's been spinning down all that time based on the P dot. So I'm using that property to determine when I measure the pulsar at the spacecraft, what is that period? And therefore, using the P dot and going backwards and knowing the distance um, from the database, uh, what, how, uh, you know, what, what parameter, how, you know, where am I in space in order to see that measurement? Okay. So I'm using that. So I'm actually using time, you know, historical data, well, not historical data, but, uh, uh, a time machine to determine that. Now, if you do that with at least three pulsars, now you get a unique position, um, that there's only couple places without ambiguity that you can see that all three pulsars would be being measured from their the distance they're at with their appropriate uh, p dot slowing them down over that time there's only a couple places that could be in order to uh, have a unique position uh, in three dimensions uh, this is the formula for that by the way and um, uh, what I did here is that, you know, basically the, the base period, which is I'm calling it, you're standing on the pulsar real time, uh, said, what is this actually, uh, was the actual uh, speed of that pulsar or spin rate of the pulsar? You got a pulsar as you observe, that's your measurement in the P dot um, times the distance in light years. Okay. So if you do that and you do three, you know, basically, little trick here with uh, uh, distance measurements, uh, you get a trial distance, pulsar distance here, and then you take that from the observed distance and you get a delta and your goal is to get a delta of zero on all three and that um, that would give you a uh, your unique, unique solution. Three, uh, three equations, three unknowns, okay? And in order to do that, I use the Excel tool. This is what the model looks like in Excel. If anybody's really interested, I can uh, send you the model and we can walk through it. But fundamentally is I put the three or the, uh, the pulsars here uh, that are, I see, notice that they're green because that means they're all visible. And then I, um, I put the observed period. So this is the, this is the key is I, I stop 25%, I go into uh, uh, inertial drive uh, instead of uh, faster than light drive. And I measure the pulsar. So I'm fundamentally standing still, so I'm no Doppler effect. I, and then I measure the pulsar period. 
um, I know what the base period is. And then basically from that, um, I can calculate a delta uh, using um, uh, the, uh, the solver in uh, um, Excel. That would give me a X, Y, and Z coordinates in parsecs. That's what I've got here. So that is my position that based on trying to get my, uh, my delta errors down to zero, okay? So, um, and this would give me also a, a distance. What it'll do is it'll vary these, I'll vary these distances here and using all the math um, uh, until the uh, deltas go to zero and that'll, uh, or as low as possible. And that gives me uh, a position in, in space, okay, with a, a certain error. Anyway, so it worked out pretty well. Um, this is the uh, solver configuration. Uh, I did find that there's a couple issues with solver that uh, um, I'd rather have a, a more uh, uh, design something better uh, than using solver. Obviously, you know, once you get the basic concept, then uh, I think you can do this uh, easily in another program and you won't have some of the, this thing doesn't like certain configurations that you put in here. So this is the, this configuration worked. Uh, I had some errors doing it different other ways. So uh, I threw this out for anybody who wanted to try it. Uh, so you, had, you have to start where I did. It took me about three weeks to figure out how to get solver to work with this. Okay. Um, what is my errors? Well, I calculated the, I, I got the standard error and you can see the based on, and I, what I did is I did it. What is the pulsar error based on, um, you know, one, one to eight pulsars. And uh, what you find here is that one pulsar gives me an error, but I don't know, I don't really have a good position. Um, so I don't really know if I'm very far off because I only got one pulsar. If I do the two pulsars, I get really far, about 300 light years, so 3000 light years away. Third pulsar comes right back down. Uh, and then after that, you basically normalize off uh, to hit about six pulsars. Six pulsars is what I was using in this uh, as the trial. More pulsars, better, um, but uh, it'll give you an error rate. So big picture is um, at least three pulsars. And uh, from this point of view is five to six pulsars is the best. It gives you a pretty consistent low error rate on, uh, on your, uh, your performance here. What does that error mean? Well, the eight pul using eight pulsars, I have an error here about 0.02 light years, and this is in kilometers. And you can see the edge of the solar, Jupiter, Pluto, edge of the solar system. You know, we're pretty far out there, but realize that Alpha Centauri, you know, am I gonna hit, which, which solar system am I gonna hit? I'm really close to our solar system here with my max error and uh, with eight pulsars. And I totally miss Alpha Centauri, which is at, you know, a lot farther away, 4.3 light years. And I can get within 0.02 light years using this method. And when you get more, and once you get this method going, you get more accuracy and you get more better measurements, uh, uh, pulsar spin rates and uh, better tools, you can dr definitely drop that number down to where you maybe get to the edge of the solar system or to a planet. So. You don't use this method to aim at Earth. You aim, you're basically aiming at the sun, the solar system, and then you have to go use closer in uh, navigation to, to refine your model in order to navigate through the solar system. But you can definitely get pretty close to the solar system with this method. Okay, so let's just do an example here. We're gonna go to 452B. Um, galactic coordinates, galactic centric coordinates. Uh, we have to choose the pulsars that are visible along the entire path. Uh, observations, you got to stop to make an observation. You can't run faster than light speed and make an observation. Uh, you're going to calculate your new position and then make course corrections appropriately. So I am going to go, this is the, this before up front. Uh, you need to go three dimensional space. 
uh, X, Y, X, Z, uh, Y, Z planes. And we're going to stop every 25% of the path to take an observation and see where we're going. Um, I selected based on the position at those points. So the ideal, the ideal path is assuming you're on course, uh, you're 25%, 50 and 75% positions based on that um, at all three axes. These, all of these pulsars, you can see their names over here, are visible at those points. Now, if you look at the entire database, which I had set up for this, a lot of pulsars are not visible uh, along the entire path or are only visible at certain XYZ planes or whatever, but not through all three planes. So these are all three planes, they're visible and you get a value. Uh, and therefore, these are all good for navigation. Okay, you run your model and um, you find observed pulsar periods. Now, I cheated a little bit here. I actually, um, I actually uh, assumed I was off course at the 25% point. So I put those numbers in, I calculate what those would, would have been at the off course position and I put those here and that's what, and so it came up with a solution uh, at this XYZ in parsecs. Now that's from the Galactic Center. And I came up with that at my 25% point, I was off course here. Okay, so what do you do now? I mean, as a good navigator, it's the, your joy is that you get a, a fix that you sort of trust so you can actually do something to navigate. So here is the assumption here is that I'm off course. I'm gonna to have to change position three dimensionally. So I just, I just can't aim here in X, Y coordinates. I have to aim there in X, Y, X, Z, and Y, Z coordinates to change, to get back on course to the 50% mark. Now I can also go from that point right straight to 452B. The assumption here is that my original course I was avoiding black holes and nebula and various things I didn't want to hit. So you'd have to do a lot, a lot more than just aim and and, uh, and go because there may be a lot more stuff in between that you know a quick course correction might might hit them. So the assumption is there's a lot more stuff there you got to do while you're navigating. Um, so we, we calculate an updated course figure out how long we need to take to the 50% mark. And at the 50% mark, you go, we do the same, same process. And you find another, uh, another position and uh, you're good to go. Okay, so in summary, um, it, it's reasonable accuracy if you're gonna aim at a solar system. After that, you need to go do in, uh, internal solar system navigation, probably much like Voyager is doing now, um, you reduced you need a better thing than solver in Excel. And I'm sure that, that easily will happen. Once you got the uh, basics done, figured out here, basic math, uh, you can do this in anything. Um, and um, the other thing is you can probably see in big pictures, you can probably see the earth move. And I haven't done this yet. If you take, and this is something that, you know, maybe the, the guys who uh, do pulsars, um, if you can collect the, uh, a number of pulsar positions over time, over the year, um, another uh, spin rates, we can actually do this and see if Earth, if we can actually see Earth move in galactic coordinates um, using this method. So that would be the real term time observation where you see if the Earth can be used as a uh, uh, spacecraft and uh, calculate its position over time. Um, now, in terms of SETI, um, I originally did another paper on uh, using the uh, uh, pulsars uh, on the, uh, the Voyagers to, you know, for the ETs find it, they can figure out where the Earth is on the pulsars. Um, but I think if you, you can actually, uh, you, this will be able to tell you um, which pulsars to use. You can't use any pulsars to figure out your position or an ET to figure out its position. Uh, you need to assume over time where that, let's say the Voyager is going to be in a thousand years and then say what pulsars are visible at that point. 
uh, to find out um, where Earth is. Um, and you're going to have to get more than three pulsars because over time they're not, all those three pulsars may not be visible. Okay. All right. Well, that was a fun exercise. Um, and uh, uh, it can actually be used uh, by students. Uh, and the math is relatively straightforward. Um, but the goal here is that what can I do with the pulsar data once I collect it? Well, here you can actually probably track Earth around the, the galaxy using this method. Uh, if you keep collecting the uh, pulsars uh, over time. Okay, Paul, uh, any questions? Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. You saw that in the chat. Oh, wait a minute. I missed it. Okay. Uh, how do you, uh, would you, just for your expansion? Okay, so um, I'm calling this galactic navigation. Once you get past the galaxy, is pretty much not being expanding inside the galaxy. Um, the gravity is offsetting the uh, expansion. It's really outside the it's between galaxies that the uh, the expansion is happening. Um, so uh, that's why we're not having the big uh, big rip kind of thing or something like that. So um, I'm not accounting for expansion at all. I'm assuming we're uh, just doing galactic navigation for now. Uh, and not intergalactic navigation. If you do start doing intergalactic navigation, um, we do know the Hubble constant. We know approximately how fast the, everything's expanding. You'd have to add another, uh, some more uh, variables onto these equations to account for the Hubble constant expansion rates. And that'd be how I'd do it. I didn't do it in this. I assumed that we were not expanding inside the galaxy. Good question, though. That's a... Yeah, uh, the golden record. Um, I actually did a paper on this. Uh, one of my, my first papers to figure out, I didn't know anything about pulsars, so I actually figured out if can I, if I was an ET, could I figure out uh, the pulsar locations on that? And uh, if you go to the... Um, go to that DSES website, you can find it. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, approach to the way they were, they used, they used uh, dots and dashes basically to, uh, to give an indication of uh, period and, um, and, uh, and uh, angles, et cetera. And so, uh, yeah, that's a, yeah, it's on the Pioneer plaque too, you're right. And um, so, uh, if you look at that, and I actually came up with what the error rate is. Uh, if, if an ET picked that up, could he find uh, could he find Earth? Um, and uh, so, uh, let's see, you know, I and I don't know how they determine which pulsars to use. Um, and uh, I. I'm not sure that all those pulsars are visible. They just used about 12 to 14 pulsars, as I remember right. And um, I don't know if all of those are visible. They're all visible from Earth. The question is, if, if Voyager goes out to Alpha Centauri eventually, or in that area, or at least that distance, all right, is it, if the ET picks it up then, could they see all those pulsars? My guess is it's close enough. They probably could see most of them. But maybe not all of them, and all the three. And by the way, it have to be in all three dimensions too, um, all three planes. Uh, okay. Are there any I think more that's questions? it. Thirteen. <clears throat> if uh, we only slowed down to sublight speed, would we be able to correct for the up? Yes. The the issue is mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. if you're faster than light, you can't see electromagnetic interference. So that beam, you can't. You with the equipment we have now. Of course, faster than light speed isn't one of those, but that's okay. If you're below that, you can correct for Doppler. If you know your exact course and speed uh, and it's lower than uh, speed of light, wow, it, it gets hard when you start getting past like 0.3C or speed of light. Uh, my understanding that, that a lot of weird effects happen. So um, if you were dead in space, that'd be perfect and you can have a really great measurement. 
after that, you have to correct for it. And then that's just more advanced and relativistic advancements in uh, measurements that it's gonna, you're going to have to adjust for. Uh, it's teaching you how far can you travel in FTL before, wait, before you completely lost or are you never lost? Oh, yes, you can be completely lost, but it's a big, space is big, right? So um, you can be knocked off course. And um, I'm saying is, uh, I think it was uh, six, I forget exactly how many light years this was apart. It's gonna be quite a while at the speed you're going at light, you know, light years to get lost, all right? Too far, you can get lost in with 10 light years or so, it's like a, a submarine, right? I, I could, as, a, as the navigator, it took me, I would not worry too much in open ocean if I didn't get a fix for multiple days, right? I just didn't worry because it's, you know, it's a big ocean and, uh, and I have a lot of area to, to fly in. If I'm traveling somewhere with um, close proximity to hazards like islands and uh, black holes and uh, other things, Yes, I need a lot tighter navigation fixes and uh, and more of it. So I can. It's not getting lost. It's how far, you know. When am I going to start hitting navigation hazards and black holes? And and uh, I keep saying black holes, but you know, it could be stars or you know asteroid fields or whatever. Uh, on the periods caused by the pulsar's motion around the galaxy, their own proper motion. Yeah, yeah, that's not accounted for, and that would be something to add. Um, that uh, assumption here is that the uh, that we're all traveling in the same. The pulsars are close enough that we're all traveling together, and uh, you know as the galaxy spins. And I'm not accounting for the pulsar drift, but some of the new uh, uh, some of the new readings. I, I forget what uh, what's the new spacecraft that's given all this databases um, that is also accounting for pulsar drift. And I did find that one of the pulsars used in the, uh, the Voyager map was actually moved. It was one of those higher speed pulsars. It actually moved from the position it was back in uh, 20 years ago or so. <coughs> so they are moving relative to the earth. They're not in, in, in the sky in celestial coordinates. They are moving based on how close they are. So uh, yeah, we have to account for that. I did not hear. That's one of the uh, adjustments to tune up your uh, your thing. Um, let's see. Uh, if the pulsar pulse glitch, does the p dot rate permanently change? Is there a way to account for that? Um, I from what I've seen on the um, the glitches is that <coughs> they form a, a definite. Um, change in the, uh, the, the period and they usually recover. Now, whether they recover to the exact period or P dot, uh, I don't, I'm not an expert on that. Um, but what I have seen is they do recover close to what the original was. And that's the other thing is once these guys glitch, my guess is you're just gonna have to monitor it until you get a new, new decent P dot uh, that you trust that's been <clears throat> you know, years, you know, that's the steady state. Um, and I would probably not use a pulsar that has a history of glitches uh, because of that. Um, because if you're out in open space, you know, you just don't know. If a, if a pulsar, is, if it has a habit of glitching, you just don't know whether it glitched or not while you're in FTL and it, we're out of, out of picture there. Okay. Um, Rich, thank you very much. Okay. Absolutely fascinating, captivating. Um, All right. Next time, next time we get you back, I'd like you to give a presentation on your faster than light propulsion system. Yeah, be, um, yeah. I, I'm a nuke submariner, but uh, I'm not a. Uh, uh, yeah, I haven't got the FTL figured out yet. That's that's the back end guys. <laughs> that's what we used to say. We 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 fight the ship, they push. Right, and okay. so. Uh, you know, the, get, get, a, get a guy that pushes uh, an FTL, uh, you know, spacecraft around and uh, I'll interview him. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very All much. Right. Appreciate it.
one of the great things about radio astronomy is the um is a vast range of stuff that people get their heads around. Um, and um, I have great pleasure in introducing Pablo um, for something completely different. So um, Pablo, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Appreciate it. Let me share the screen here and start this uh, presentation from the beginning. Um, let's see, here we go. And now I got to change the display. Okay. I hope you can see me now and you can see my presentation on the screen. Yes, that worked. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody from Los Angeles, California. My name is Pablo Lewin and I uh, want to thank the British Astronomical Association and Sarah and uh, for inviting me for something completely different here. I am uh, a couple of disclaimer points. I am a newbie. I am not a scientist. I am not an engineer. Uh, but by the time we're done with uh, my little presentation here, uh, you will be able to uh, build your own uh, radio telescope for your backyard with little or no money uh whether it be dollars pounds shekels or euros um so uh a little bit about myself uh i'm an active ham radio operator since 1976 wa6 rsv i work called bands i'm working on uh uh, uh actually uh instigating uh, my eme operation i have the antennas already set up for earth moon earth operations I'm also an active citizen scientist, uh, visual and CCD astronomer, member of the uh, AAVSO, uh, American Association, uh, Astronomical Association, SARA, NASA, I'm a member of the uh, NASA test follow-up uh, group one program, where I uh, uh, not only gather data, but I actually uh, reduce the data and give it to NASA, NASA Exoplanet Watch, and also I'm looking for near earth asteroids, but we're not gonna talk about that tonight. Uh, I have my own private uh, observatory in the back, very cheaply uh, uh, built, but it's uh, research level. And I'm also a retired airline pilot, uh, recently retired first with Trans World Airlines and eventually with American Airlines. And I just retired. Does that mean that I know a lot about this? Absolutely not, but let's get on uh, with this. Uh, this presentation is going to be basically for newbies. I mean, we have a wide range. We have Dr. Russell, Wolfgang, and everybody, and uh, Ted Klein, who are very experienced. And so um, my uh, uh, presentation is geared towards uh, the beginner, uh, some to get you into the into the uh, uh, radio uh, radio astronomy game. I uh, remember that. Uh, 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 journey of a thousand leagues starts with one step and i'm gonna by the time i'm done with this you you will be equipped to actually build your hydrogen line uh, uh, obs uh little observatory which is going to be very satisfying and and this is akin to the visual uh pretty picture portion of visual astronomy this is the pretty picture portion of uh radio astronomy and you're going to be able to build it nowhere uh, anywhere but a little history for those of you who don't know where this all came from as i didn't uh radio astronomy is as you know is a subfield of astronomy that studies celestial objects at radio frequencies not only do we have visual fr uh, uh frequencies but uh, uh through radio frequencies you can see a lot more details and stuff and uh effects and uh uh, situations that are going on in, in space by using different radio frequencies. The first detection of radio waves from an astronomical object was in 1932 when uh, Carl Jansky of, of Bell Telephone Laboratories observed radiation coming from the Milky Way. He was looking for a way to get rid of some interference they were getting, and uh, he realized that the signals were not coming from planet Earth, uh, signals were uh, coming from uh, outside of uh, uh, planet Earth. Uh, the uh, 
first serious uh, radio astronomer uh, was a ham radio operator in the United States. His name is uh, Grote Reber, uh, W9GFZ. Uh, he was the pioneer in American astronomy, which combined his interest in amateur radio and amateur astronomy. And as you can see, radio astronomy was born from ham radio operators, from uh, engineers, ham radio operators, not necessarily astronomers or, or scientists. So uh, this system that I, uh, I'm going to tell you about, it's going to pretty much uh, give you the same capability that they had back then and a little bit more as I'm, I'm going to show you. Um, and his radio antenna, which you can see on the picture right here, um, I don't know if you can see it right here, um, he built it in his backyard from uh, his monies, from uh, uh, his design, and, and I don't know if you can see the picture here, there is the uh, fence to his neighbor. So kudos to his neighbor because he didn't care that he actually built such a large antenna right, uh, right there, and this is uh, his picture. And uh, for nearly a decade, he was the first uh, radio astronomer in, in, in the world. Anyway, uh, also in Great Britain, let's, uh, since I'm talking to a mostly Brit British uh, audience, uh, a lot of advancements came from uh, Great Britain. Uh, the, uh, because of World War II, development of radar, and uh, they, in, you know, I'm going to just read what it says. The development of radar during the Second World War has two consequences for radio astronomy. Uh, firstly, sources of radio interference, which might confuse radar locations, have to be identified. So, as you can see, uh, Great Britain and uh, British scientists also had a hand in it. In fact, they were the first ones to uh, uh, the, discover the uh, first discrete source of radio em emission, which lay in the constellation of Cygnus, uh, in which later became uh, Cygnus A. And you can read the uh, slide. I'm not going to read the, uh, the entire slide, but uh, as you can see, uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, great developments in radio astronomy in uh, Great Britain. And just one more piece of uh, theory, and I'll get on with it, I promise. If you don't know what the hydrogen line is, which is basically what this system is going to detect, uh, here's a brief explanation. Hydrogen atoms randomly emit photons at a wavelength of 21 centimeters. 21 centimeters, that's a frequency of 1420.4058 megahertz. 1.420 gigahertz. Normally, a single hydrogen atom will only very rarely emit a photon, but the galaxy and even empty space, and I'm going to show you because I'm going to show you my radio telescope live that I have about 50 meters behind me, how it's between uh, the arms of the galaxy, and it's actually detecting right now uh, hydrogen atoms. Uh, by um, so it's filled with a hydrogen atom. So the average effect is an obser observable RF frequency spike at 1.4420 gig uh, gigahertz. By pointing a radio telescope at the night sky and averaging the RF power over time. A power spike indicating that the hydrogen line can be observed at a frequency or a spectrum plot. This can be used for some interesting experiments. For example, you could measure the size and shape of our galaxy, and you're going to be able to actually do that with this very little system. Thicker areas of the galaxy will have more hydrogen and thus a larger spike, whereas the spike will be significantly smaller or non existent when pointing to empty space. Uh, and you can actually measure the rotational speed of our galaxy. Uh, by noting the frequency Doppler shift. Okay, enough of that. What can we do with this system? Uh, this is a depiction right here of uh, the basic sy system. And uh, as you can see, this is SDR Sharp, which is an SDR receiver uh, program. Uh, this is the uh, IF plugin, which will depict uh, the reception of uh, the hydrogen line. And this is an, a planetarium program, a Stellarium in this case, which is free, and that will give you a visual representation of the movement of the galaxy, and you will be, be able to see here uh, how this uh, affects the reception. Uh, we have Chronolops here, which is a free program. Everything that I'm going to tell you is either going to be free or extremely cheap. 
Chrono Labs can will be able to, you'll be able to actually make some movies out of this presentation so you can leave this system on for days make little movies because I know that most of you who are watching here have a TikTok account at least uh okay maybe not a TikTok account but uh, you may want to show your family friends scientists you can be in a school high school secondary school whatever you call them and you can actually show the rotation of the universe uh and uh actually explain to other people what's going on visually which is uh, a lot more palatable especially these days since we're very visual people this is the antenna that this basic system uses and it's a uh a stock antenna uh from uh that's a telephone um, uh, basically or a wi-fi antenna which you can get for $50, 50 pounds, 50 euros, or for free. And then I'm gonna show you how you can get bigger antennas for even back. But let me show you this video here. And uh, as you can see, the universe is moving here and you can begin to see a spike as it gets to okay. the part of the universe. Okay. How much longer? Probably about half an hour. I'm sorry. Uh, is that a question or? Can you still hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. That's fine. Oh, okay. Because I heard somebody, maybe they had a question or something like yeah. that. Okay. So basically, this is what the system is going to do for you. Um, it's called a scope in a box. That was the name given to by uh, the Society of uh, uh, Amateur uh, Radio Astronomers. And uh, they sell it there. But it's a basic scope in a box. And it's based on the... Um, article which was on the RTLSDR article cheap and easy hydrogen line radio astronomy with an RTLSDR Wi-Fi in a parabolic grit dish LNA and SDR sharp and I'm going to show you where you can actually go to that article and uh, build it yourself it uses an off the shelf 2.4 gigahertz dish yes 2.4 gigahertz dish which is one gigahertz more than the 1.4 that it should be tuned to but it actually works. So the SWR uh, standing wave ratio, it's probably low enough still at that frequency, you can actually get some excellent results. You can get an off the shelf SDR RTL with a bias T and I'm gonna to explain to you what a bias T is. And uh, that's about 20, $25, maybe 20 pounds. I don't know, in Europe, it might be, or in Great Britain might be different. And uh, you can get an uh, off the uh, shelf LNA uh, that a uh, company called Newelec sells it, and it's uh, also very inexpensive. With these items, a little computer, cheap computer, you can build your first radio telescope, uh, and you can get in the game. Okay, this is what you need. Once again, you go to the S rtlsdr.com, and uh, you look for a search for cheap and easy hydrogen line radio astronomy with an RTL SDR Wi Fi parabolic grid dish, LNA and SDR sharp. And that will give you every detail on how to put it together. Then you have to get the Newelec uh, Sawbird uh, H1 LNA, that's uh, low, low noise amplifier. And uh, this one here comes with a built in switch that allows you to switch from the antenna to a 50 ohm reference uh, load and uh, which I use all the time and it'll be able you'll be able to actually uh, 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 well I'll explain to you in a second uh, the uh, you get a little tripod you get the little antenna which usually goes from 85 to 80 dollars and here's the SDR RTL SDR uh, uh, receiver and pretty much that's pretty much all you need the software that you're going to need it's number one a planetarium software uh something to depict the movement of the milky way because with this system you're not going to be able to uh, get pulsars you're not going to be able to do major research uh, with this little system you're going to be able to uh detect the milky way You'll be able to uh, actually make pictures of the Milky Way with a program that's being created by one of the viewers here, Ted Klein. He's created a program that actually takes the data out of this little system. And you, you're going to be able to actually come up with uh, 
uh, a, a depiction, a, a radio picture of the Milky Way. SDR Sharp, which is free, all these programs are free. In order to detect the hydrogen line, you need the software capable of integrating and averaging many FFT samples over time. Averaging the samples reduces the SDR's quantization noise, uh, which is the calibration. That's what you need the uh, 50 ohm uh, switch for, to calibrate. It's the dark uh, picture on a visual telescope. You need something to calibrate it with. And that's why you have to calibrate it first without a signal so you can actually uh, discern what the signal looks like. And because a uh, galaxy is moving fairly slowly in the sky, you can safely average between five to 10 minutes at a time. You're also going to need Chronolapse, which is a free and discontinued re uh, recorder or screen grab recorder of the, uh, of the uh, screen, which will allow you to make uh, a video of uh, over a period of 24 hours, two days. I've had my system running for six months. I usually do a video every two, two and a half days uh, because it's a lot of fun. Also, if you wanna pay a little bit, and I'm gonna show you how useful this is, there's a program called Radio Eyes. So this is optional, it's not free. It's also a uh, uh, program like Stellarium, but it's geared towards uh, radio astronomers. And that will give you a lot of important and interesting information as your radio telescope is detecting signals from around the sky. Um, okay, once again, uh, here's a little video of basically what you're going to get right there. Okay, uh, once again, uh, this is the uh, grid antenna right here. I've tried several ways to actually increase the SNR of the uh, radio antenna. I first tried some uh, uh, aluminum or aluminum or, uh, foil right here, and it did not work. It actually reduced, for some reason, the, uh, the uh, gain on this antenna. Uh, great for grilling hot dogs, but not good for this little system. Uh, however, chicken wire or as I call it, chicken wire, quarter inch right here, that really increased the uh, uh, gain of the, this little system. Uh, also, what you can do to increase the power, the reception, is to uh, put a, another LNA in series with the first LNA. And it doesn't have to be uh, a specific LNA. You can get a $20 uh, wideband low noise amplifier in series with the other one, and that's going to increase the signal, the amplitude of the signal that you're going to get from the uh, uh, from the galaxy uh, exponentially. Uh, you have to remember, though, that when you add an LNA, you have to buy what it uh, what it's called a DC block, which is nothing more than a little uh, device that has a capacitor in there to isolate DC from LNA to LNA, because some of these LNAs, especially the off-the-shelf LNAs, I found that uh, uh, they uh, sometimes bleed a little bit of uh, DC power and actually makes the one of the LNAs actually turn off. So you got to have a DC block in there. Also, what you can do to uh, increase the usability of a little system like this is to get a, a linear actuator and uh, they're very cheap and with that you can have the capability of uh, uh, tilting it up and down where you can change the elevation and you can actually start working on uh, drift down models of the uh, radio sky of the uh, uh, of the um, galaxy and that's going to be very useful when uh, eventually you start getting some uh, data out of uh, this little system. And with the program, such as the one from uh, Ted Klein, you'll be able to actually build, uh, create your own uh, uh, picture of the radio sky. Uh, the results that can be expected with a scope in a box, first of all, mainly galactic H1 line detection. You can actually will be able to see uh, a clear depiction of the Doppler effect, 
uh, where some of the arms of the galaxy are coming towards you. That's where the frequency drifts higher or where the arms of the galaxy are going away from you. You'll be able to actually see uh, the frequency going lower. You're going to get a visual display uh, in the form of uh, a uh, little video that you're going to be able, be able to make with movie results. Also, with this program, this is the IF plug right here, you are able to get raw data collection, uh, which is depicted right here. So uh, the, this is the IF plug, which is attached to the SDR sharp uh receiver and this is what we use in conjunction with this display here to visually see the changes in uh, in uh, galactic uh, radio signal the h1 radio signal but you're also able uh to get raw data and this is the raw data you, you will be able to use eventually to create uh a picture of the radio sky um let's see computer strategies uh one of the problems with this system is that uh it requires the sdr sharp to be connected to the usb and usb is extremely sensitive to distance as most of you know so what you could do what i did and there are very small computers there's raspberry pis there are many computers such as this lenovo think uh, center uh, many computers that you can actually uh, place at the foot of your uh, radio mini radio telescope and uh, connect to it through a uh, uh, remote uh, control uh, program such as uh, uh, team viewer splashed up or uh, many, many more. And that's exactly what I did with my system because I found out through my experience that RTL SDR, the uh, uh, little SDR, is very sensitive uh, to uh, being connected to the USB as close to the computer as possible. So in my case, my system is about 50 meters behind me in my backyard, uh, so I had to place the computer at the bottom of the uh, uh, radio uh, telescope. Now, you have to keep in mind that computers generate radio frequency. So I chose a computer that it's uh, who, uh, with a clock of 3.4 uh, gigahertz. And I stay away from anything from 1.4 to 1.8 gigahertz for obvious reasons. Also, I connect to it through, um, uh, through a, a cable. Uh, I don't use Wi-Fi, once again, because this is a very sensitive system, and even though you do have filters with the uh, Sawbird, you don't, generally speaking, want to have want to have as little interference as possible. Uh, when you use a uh, headless, is called a uh, computer, uh, and, and by the way, Paul, give me a five-minute uh, warning, okay, when, when I'm getting to my limit, because I'm not timing myself. Uh, when you use a computer uh, system without a monitor, uh, you got to use a dummy plug uh, for the monitor, because uh, otherwise you're not going to get the full uh, display, uh, remote display. So you can get this for eight, nine dollars, and I don't know how much it is in in Europe. Uh, this is a USB switch, and I use this USB switch to connect to the uh, LNA, which in this case has a, a dummy load uh, a 50 ohm reference uh, load so what i do is whenever i want to uh, uh, create that uh, radio dark uh, in other words i want to uh, uh, make sure that uh, the system is calibrated first i turn this on oops excuse me I, I turn the switch on and uh, that disconnects the antenna automatically and connects it to the built in uh, 50 ohm uh, load. Okay, and it works great. Now, with this system, you can also use the same software LNA and obviously this is a game uh, radio astronomy is a game of aperture. Uh, the bigger the antenna, the better tuned it is, it's going to be better for you. Uh, so basically, uh, I don't know, wherever you may live around the world, there are still large dishes that people want to get rid of 
for free. Uh, and uh, in your neighborhoods from the 1980s, 1990s, some of them may still be in use, but if they're not, you can get something like this and actually build yourself a very interesting and uh, viable uh, radio uh, 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 telescope. And uh, if you get one of those, then you're going to have to build what it's called a feed horn, uh, which is basically the uh, secondary mirror on your visual telescope. And it's very easy and very cheap to build. You're talking to a person who up until recently has never welded anything in his life. You can get something like this, which is a Bensomatic uh, welder, I don't know, around the world. And actually, you can actually uh, put these things together yourself. In this case, here's a uh, duct that I bought for nine dollars. Here's the lit to the duct. You weld it to the duct and lo and behold now you have a very viable feed horn where you can actually uh, drill a hole. You uh, put one of these receptacles here in uh, a female in uh, connector and I don't know if you can see it in the picture here. You put a little piece of wire here, which is actually uh, a quarter uh, wavelength uh, of the 21 centimeters, which would be approximately five point something centimeters. But in reality, uh, it should be about 3.8 to four centimeters right here. And you connect it to the LNA right here. And lo and behold, you gotta get a 20 dB gain on, on your reception. You're gonna get amazing results on your little telescope and if you have a nano vna uh, you can actually cut it to exact frequency in this case this frequency is 1.1 1 .1, uh, on the snr which is fantastic um, okay now the azimuth is the biggest problem and for the azimuth uh let me go to the next one i actually changed my system. I got rid of the little antenna. I bought a dish on the internet for a couple hundred dollars, a uh, steel dish, and I needed a place to mount it. And uh, some of these uh, mounts are anywhere from three to five thousand US dollars plus shipping because they usually come from Europe. There are some in the US. And frankly, who can justify that nowadays? So I decided to build my own on uh, alt azimuth altitude azimuth uh steerable uh mount for less than 300 dollars using everyday uh items and this is what it looks like right here and uh i'm going to show you what i used it's super high engineering what i used i used the front wheel hub bearing for a chevy pontiac right here for the azimuth okay now, if you're in Great Britain, you can use that of a Bentley or a Rolls Royce. Uh, I'm sure it's going to work even better. It might be a little more expensive, but in this case, you mount this bearing on top of a universal bench grinder stand, which I pay for $29. You mount this uh, uh, fence post right here on top of this. You put a sprocket. You mount another uh, L to create an L beam, uh, and all of a sudden, now we have a viable uh, mount for less, much less than $300 that you can actually manually move the antenna. And I'm going to show you how uh, live how I do it. So, as you can see, I mean, this uh, wheel hub bearing assembly is amazing. First of all, it can support a car, so it can certainly. Uh, uh, support structurally a uh, 100 pound antenna easily. And frankly, once you put it on a bearing like this to move the azimuth, you need a very small 12 volt motor with a gear and this thing is gonna be pointing in any direction you want. So this is what it looks like right here. Uh, the mount, this is the bench grider mount. I just drill a couple of holes on the ground. I pour, I by the way, I've never worked with concrete in my life. I don't have a mixer, but they have a new uh, uh, concrete mix 
that you drill the hole, you put them out in there, you pour the concrete mix, and then you pour a gallon of water, you don't have to mix. It's perfect concrete, it's done. Then, uh, as you can see on this picture right here, this is the bearing. I attach the, uh, the, the fence post to the sprocket right here. And the sprocket is going to uh, a motor, which is right here, a very small motor. It doesn't have to be big. So, and then I attached another uh, portion of the antenna to this uh, linear actuator. And now you have an altitude azimuth uh, movable antenna that you can actually aim in any directions. But the question is, how do you aim it? How do you know where to aim it? Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, okay. The next one shows you the uh, little sprockets. This is a little engine. It's only, uh, excuse me, motor, electric motor. It's only $15. Actually, I got a better one than this one here. Uh, but these motors, by the way, and the actuator, you can actually control with $30 um, uh, controllers that you can buy from a, a company called Pololu. And when you connect that to your little computer, you can actually control uh, that uh, altitude azimuth antenna remotely. At this point, you're not going to know where that's pointing, but I'm going to show you how to, how to do that for next to nothing. So anyway, here's the sprockets. Here's what it looks like at the bottom of the uh, uh, antenna right here. And this is uh, very, a very highly sophisticated uh, system that uh, prevents moisture to get into the motor, which is half a empty bottle. It works. There is this little device here from the company called Witmotion, a Chinese company, for $33. It's an act, a nine axis vibration inclinometer. Uh, it's got an accelerometer, gyro, angle, and a digital compass. It's about this big. Okay, and uh, what you do, and what I did, is I mounted this sensor on a piece of wood sticking from the bottom of the antenna because you want it as far away because it's got a magnetic detector as far away from the uh, antenna as possible. And uh, lo and behold, for what I do, for my level of experience, it works. And it works famously. And uh, I'm going to show you that uh, the beam width or the pixel on my radio telescope is about almost seven degrees. So yes, this is not going to be perfect, not up to uh, detecting pulsars and everything else, but this is good enough for any system that you may build in your backyard. Uh, you're not going to make any discoveries with it, but you're going to get some very satisfying results. And this is the simple motor controller. I have two of them on the computer, one for the uh, uh, for the uh, azimuth and one for the uh, elevation. Okay. Possible science applications so with the IF average, I already showed you. Uh, um, you can create a spectrum uh, that shows the intensity of light being emitted over a range of energies. Spectrums can be produced anyway. You're going to be able to uh, actually create uh, with Ted Klein's program. Uh, you, you'll be able to create a complete picture over a period of three, four weeks of the uh, radio sky of the galaxy. Now, um, let me see. Okay. Um, before I go here, I'm going to unshare myself. And I'm going to share another screen that I have. I have four monitors. Screen three. Um, no, that's not it. Um, no, that's not it. I apologize. Let me try to share again. Can you see the uh, this one here? Yes. The uh, display with the uh, live feed from the uh, 
from the telescope. You see that right it here? It looks like a live feed. Yeah. Okay. This is a, this is a, this is my system right now. This is live. And as you can see, I'm detecting with my system. Oh, I forgot to tell you, so a little piece of very important engineering here. Uh, this is the feed horn that I built, as I showed you before. And I had to protect it from the uh, rain and everything else. So I have a very high, uh, a piece of very high engineering here, which is a salad bowl, a plastic salad bowl that I, I post, uh, placed on top of the feed, which covers the uh, LNA and it works famously, it works great. Now, as you can see, we're detecting a little bit of the sky, even though we're not even close uh, to the thick portion of the sky. Uh, and I already have the antenna pointed, uh, aiming uh, um, in the direction uh, of, okay, let me start from the beginning. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, where is this located here? Uh, look at the elevation of the azimuth. The azimuth is about 60 degrees. I already have the antenna uh, on that azimuth. And the elevation is about uh, 59 degrees, about 60 degrees. So what I need to do right now with my system is I have to tilt the antenna. And here's the display. I'm going to go ahead and connect to the elevation, resume. And this is the elevation right here. I'm going to go ahead and move the antenna. This is my Buick system, OK? And if you can see on the right hand side, it's the uh, ADI of an airplane, the uh, attitude indicator of an airplane. So I'm going to go to where it says 30 degrees because I was at Zenith, it's zero degrees, and I got to go to 60. Okay, I didn't want to take up too much time. So let's see if it's actually accurate enough to where it's actually beginning to detect this portion. I'm going to center right about here, center here. And I'm going to put the beam right here. This is Radio Eyes, by the way. Fantastic little program. Uh, place beam. We know. Look at this. It's already beginning to detect a signal. Now, if you look over here, you can actually visualize this signal. See how it's getting lighter here? And it's beginning to build. It's, it's accumulating the data. What does it show you? This show you that it shows you that my little system, which is very unsophisticated with uh, uh, a direction finding uh, a scheme that it's really not up to scientific uh, scrutiny. Look at that. This confirms that I'm actually pointing to in the area of the uh, sky at Cygnus A. And you're going to be able to actually see a uh, secondary because uh, you're going to be able to see two arms here and you can see the secondary. Uh, portion. This is this is uh, interference transmitting. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, I am recording this. I'm making videos of this uh, with Chronolapse, and you can see this uh, uh, recording this whole thing. Okay. You see how uh, it's building? It's satisfying. Scientific, probably not, but for a beginner. This is an eye opener. And I'm using the same system that uh, anybody uses with a scope in a box, except that I just put a bigger antenna on it. And I put a, uh, I placed an LNA uh, uh, in series, uh, another low noise amplifier. Okay. Five minutes, five minutes, uh, Pablo. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that screen. I'm gonna go ahead and Share one more screen. I hope I didn't bore you guys too much. Okay. Um, Sarah sells it in the United States. You're not going to be able to uh, probably get it uh, overseas. I recommend that uh, if you're a newbie, please join the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers. Uh, you have newbies like myself. 
uh, with very little experience. And uh, you have people like Dr. Russell, uh, Wolfgang, uh, Ted Klein, and uh, Paul Hearn, very experienced uh, engineers, scientists, uh, and, and they're an amazing resource. And this is a picture of me 45 pounds ago. I've been on a diet, so I'm losing weight. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Paul Hearn, for the uh, and the British Astronomical Association. Ask any questions you want right now. I'm still not going to get paid. And if I don't know the answer, I'll make it up. I'll make it sound good. Any Oh, I want to show you something before I go. Um, OK, I'll bring it over here so I don't have to change. Uh, first of all, there's this program here. Can you see that, Paul? Yes. OK, this is a free program that was created by uh, uh, Dave, I don't know who it is. It's a system sensitivity and detection analyzer. Uh, amateur radio astronomy system sensitivity and detection analyzer. How do I know that my uh, beam width is almost seven degrees? Well, very easy. I, I, I just put uh, uh, the frequency here, the dish diameter. Let's say I have a five meter dish. I hit the recalculate and now the 3 dB beam is 2.85. This is a fantastic program. Uh, I, ha I have it up on Dropbox. If you drop me a line uh, and it's got a, a lot more information. I know that the efficiency of my uh, uh, my dish is 70 degrees. How do I know? Because it was written on the uh, manual. Is it? I don't know, but it gives me an idea. And also, if you want to know about uh, radio astronomy, uh, the great courses, they have uh, Dr. Felix Lockman, uh, and they have the most comprehensive up to uh, PhD level radio astronomy course I've ever seen. I don't have any connections with them, uh, but these are all the course uh, uh, chapters uh, that he tells you about. Anyway, that's it. Okay, any questions, answers? Does anybody know what the meaning of life is? I'm ready here. Well done. Well done indeed. Yeah. Any any questions? Any comments? You made that sound so much fun. You obviously enjoyed your yourself putting all that together. Yeah, I did. I did. It's uh, really uh, and I, I've been learning a lot. And that's the main thing to uh, advance and learn a lot. And uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy science. Oh, and by the way, the signal, it's almost off the scale here on the field. But uh, I just love it. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, does anybody have a question for Pablo while we still got him here? The interference spike was uh, probably no, it's not from the SDR because actually the movie actually shows mm -hmm. that it comes and goes. It comes uh, for probably from uh, uh, some interference. The house that you saw in the back is from my neighbor, so probably has uh, some sort of inter, uh, um, you know, router or something like that. But it comes and goes during the day, and you ha have to remember I'm the I'm in the Los Angeles County, so there's a lot of interference uh, coming from everywhere. So. Uh, it, it's probably from there and it changes it varies every day but it's they're usually very d d uh defined spikes and uh they well let me can i show you one more time here uh please uh, please do uh as you can see now it's fully detecting the uh this portion of the milky way and you can still have the spike but it's actually the spike is coming down and you can see several uh, bumps here, which I surmise, and pl please correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, are different parts uh, or arms of the Milky Way. And as I'm making the movie, uh, you will see this moving back and forth, and you will see which one's coming and which one's it's going. But uh, yeah, these spikes are very defined, and uh, they appear randomly uh, during the day. Also, some of the interfering com interference comes from my um, whisper transmitters uh, i have two full-time uh whisper uh, uh weak uh signal generator transmitters uh ham radio transmitters and uh, sometimes i see spikes from there so it'll appear and disappear 
Yeah, sure, I can share the slides. I can give them to you. Uh, this is my, by the way, this is my fourth presentation ever. I'm not used to giving presentations uh, at all. Uh, uh, kudos to uh, PowerPoint, because I didn't know how to do PowerPoints. I still don't. But if you're going to do PowerPoints, that they have a feature called uh, Title Designer. Basically, you start a slide, you throw pictures in there and, and uh, text, and then on the side, it'll tell you, hey, I got 10 choices of you to choose from that will make you look like a professional. And that's exactly what I did here. It works. It works. It works. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much, you. Pablo. Your enthusiasm is infectious. I can say that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that, that was just brilliant. Um, okay, um, time to say good night. For some of you, we're going to bed. For others, it's lunchtime, I guess. And um, next Friday, as I said earlier, we have um, Professor Skaith, uh, Goggle Bank, the Cold War, and uh, the Space Race. So see you all next Friday. Good night.